Okay, for today's lesson, I would like to talk about developing a Verilog module for the I squared C bus. I squared C is a fairly simple bus. Um, I squared C, I2C, is an abbreviation for Inter Integrated Circuit Bus. And this is just a general tutorial from the internet. Um, but the idea is that you have two control lines, SCL and SDA. SCL is serial clock and SDA is serial data. Um, these are two pull-up resistors so that if nobody is driving a device, um, or in particular nobody is syncing current on the bus, um, then these lines will always be high. That's what a pull-up resistor does. Um, so the idea is if a device wants to send a logic zero, it just opens the connection to ground um, and then these lines will be zero. All right, so that makes it a little bit more complex when you're de designing the actual I.O. system um, or the physical there, but for designing the logic above that, um, it's not too bad. One trick is that there's one device on the bus called the master, and the master's job is to um, initiate all transfers. So the master's job is going to be to start a, a, a communication with any of the slaves, and there can be many, many slaves on a bus. Um, the idea here is that each slave has an ID an address, and the master is going to um, initiate a command to um, one particular slave, although all of the slaves will see it. This is that the slave at that particular address will be the one to respond. So the advantage here is that there's no particular order to where the master and the slaves are. They all see the same lines, and they can be anywhere, any orientation on the bus, just as long as there's only one that is designated to the master. Um, all frames are sent with a start and a stop bit. A stop, or a start bit rather, um, occurs when the clock is still high. And while the clock is still high, the data drops. Um, so uh, essentially we have a low edge on the data line, followed then by the beginning of a normal transaction. Um, the stop occurs during a positive level of a clock where the data line goes high and stays high. So essentially we're returning to idle. Um, the start is used to kind of catch all the devices attention. The stop is to release the bus and let all the slaves go back to their idle condition. Um, once the start sequence has been sent, um, what they're showing here is that um, we're going to uh, use positive edge logic on the clock, so we go from a low to a high edge, and that's when the, the slave device is going to be reading its value. So if we're going to be using flip-flops, we need to drive the flip-flop value during a low edge so that during the next positive edge of that clock, the value is, is latched on the output. Um, addresses are 7 bits or up to 10 bits. Um, we're going to just stick with a 7-bit for the first few examples and then we'll extend it gradually to the 10-bit. Um, they are in most significant bit order, just like the data is in most significant bit order. After sending uh, the 7 bits of address, the master will also send a command to be either a read or a write. So once we've identified which slave device is to pay attention to the rest of the transaction, we're going to tell it that we want to read or write. In the case of a write, as it shows here, we send the start, we send the address, we send the, um, uh, the write command, and then we begin, we wait for the device to respond with an acknowledgement, and then we begin writing the data. So there will be eight bits worth of data written out to the device, and we can then wait for the device to acknowledge and then we can decide whether or not we want to send more data bits um, and then a stop sequence to uh, finish sending all data. So for instance, some EEPROM devices will allow you to write multiple writes to some starting address. Um, and, the, and those are defined by the vendor. A read kind of follows the same idea um, on a read what we're going to do is we're going to send the address, we're going to send a 1 for a read, 
and we're going to wait for the acknowledgement from the slave and then the master will begin pulsing the clock and the slave will begin reading the data again um, on the positive edge the slave will have latched out the data um, and when we're done the master actually sends the acknowledgement um, which would be an acknowledged uh, high or low the clock will go down one more time at that point we begin to um, either send a start bit or we do our stop sequence which is going to be to bring the clock high and then bring data up and then leave them both high um, so it's actually fairly straightforward there's many 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 examples uh, of I squared C signaling available um, and we're going to kind of work our way through it I think the thing to pay attention to is anytime you see a timing diagram like this is that there's different states that we're going to be in. Um, we're in the state of sending a start bit, we're in the state of being idle, we're in the state of sending addressing, a command, we're waiting for an acknowledgement, that's a state. We're going to be sending data as a state. Uh, we're going to wait for another acknowledgement or send another acknowledgement as a state. Um, and we're going to eventually transition to either repeated start or to a stop, also states. So um, we're going to have a bunch of different states, which kind of tells us we're going to be looking at a finite state machine. So without further ado, let's begin looking at how to set this up. Um, I had actually begun this before, so we're going to just start over. And we're going to call this step one. Um, we're not going to start trying to do the final version right away. Uh, we'll work our way into it. So here in step one, um, because we have a state machine, we know we're going to have to have a clock. And we're going to want to reset the state so that we can reset this device. Um, we also know that we're going to have I squared C SDA and I squared C SCL. Um, those will both be output for now. Um, we're going to actually have that a complication related to these later on, but for now we're just going to start off with that. So with just those four signals, um, what we're going to try to do here is make a, a module that can drive the data line um, to send out an I squared C command. In this case, our goal is to write a command to write to device at address 50, the text 50, and we're going to try to write the command uh, 0xa, or the value AA. So that's our goal. That's our signaling pattern that we're going to try to achieve. So to achieve that, we know that we're going to start off with a finite state machine. So um, always at we'll do the pause edge of our logic clock. And whenever we have a state machine with a reset, we do the reset logic. So if reset is equal to 1, begin, and else begin, end. And so essentially this is the standard way that we do all of our state machines. Um, if we're going to actually have a state machine, we're going to need to have a state and that's going to be a register. We'll make him 8 bits for now. And in reset, state will equal 0. I'm using the non-blocking assignment here just to kind of keep my logic a little bit simpler. Um, let's deal with another complication up here as well. Uh, we have here registers and wires. So we're going to designate them here as such. Okay, um, and so reset really should set every register every time. And so when we're in reset, we're going to set our values like that. So at this point now, we have uh, registers initialized. We're ready to begin with the definition of the state machine. And if we think back to the, the signaling diagram, um, our state machine included things like um, an idle state, a start state, sending the address state. So we can begin to do that. So we're going to start the definition of a state machine um, with our case. And a case does not have a begin, but it does have an end. And inside here then we have all of our states enumerated. So for instance, state 0 will be our idle state. And it has a begin and an end. 
And if we're idle, we're going to drive, I'm just going to worry about the SDA signals for just a moment. We're going to drive SDI high, sorry, SDA high. And at this point, we're just going to loop through. So once we've been in the idle state, we're just going to stay in the idle. We're going to go on to begin a new transaction. So if that's the case, we're going to go to state one. And in state one, we can begin and end. And we're going to drive SDA high. And we're going to go on to state two. And if we're in state two, see state one was really the start state. And this is really the idle state. Now, in state two, we have to start sending the address. Um, remember, it's a seven bit address. We're going to send the first bit. Um, if we're going to send out uh, hex 50, that's going to be a 0110010. So this is the first address bit, or the most significant address bit, maybe a better comment. And so that's going to be I squared C SDA is equal to zero, state is equal to three, um, and then in state three, we're going to send bit five. And we're going to go on to state four, and state four, we're going to send bit four. Is also going to be a one, and it's usually right around now that I start thinking this is really getting kind of hard to understand. Um, we've got these numbers for the states, and I've kind of lost track of where we are in the states. And really, I'm sending these bits of the addresses out, and I'm sending them one at a time. Well, there has to be a better way to do that. And it turns out that there is. And the idea here, what we're going to try to do, is we're going to make a register to hold the address. So in this case, we have a 7-bit address. We'll call it address. And during reset, we're going to initialize it to be 7 bits with a hexadecimal value of 50. And at the same time, I'm going to make a register called count. And we'll start count off as 8 bits of decimal 0. Now, um, when I'm in the sending the address state, what I want to do, and I think this is the sending the address state, what I want to do is I want to use the address register to drive the data register one bit at a time. So I'm going to be able to say something like SDA count, sorry, SDA is equal to adder of count. And then if count is equal to zero, I want to be able to go on to the next state. Else, we're going to have count is equal to count minus one. So the idea now is that we're going to stick in this state two until we've sent all seven bits of the address, and then we'll go on to state three. However, um, this is assuming that the first time we go into this state, the count has the value six. And we'll stay in this state until count has the value zero. When count has the value zero, we will still have been in this state one time. So we will have gone through this state seven times, just like in a for loop. If you started the for loop at 6 and went while it's greater than or equal to 0, you'll have gone through the for loop 7 times. Um, the difference here is just like a, well, it's kind of like a for loop. We have to initialize count before we go into this state. So that means that in state 1, when I want to go to state 2, I must also set the count to be equal to what I want the count to be. So in this case, I want count to be equal to 6. And then we'll count down here, so 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Once I get to 0, I'm not going to actually make it negative, although it wouldn't hurt if I did. Um, we'll go on to state 3. In fact, this else is really not needed. Um, so that would take care of sending out the 8 addresses, or sorry, the 7 addresses uh, in this state. There's one other improvement that we're very quickly going to want to make here. 
and that's these state numbers. State numbers are okay for simple little state machines, but already we see that it's becoming unwieldy. Um, it's kind of hard to keep track of what number is what state. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the local param syntax in Verilog. And I'm going to be giving the names to these states. So state idle is going to equal 0. State start is equal to 1. Local param state adder is equal to 2. So we've given names, and now we can go in here, and we can change the state machine to actually use these names. So in state idle, we go to start. If we're in start, we go to adder. If we're in adder, we go to read write. If we're in state read write, oops, and we're going to want to make um, sorry one is a read, and then we're going to go to state wait act. Okay, so this is going to be from here. Local param state right back is four. Data was our next thing, it's five. Um, and we know we're looking ahead, we're going to have a stop. All right, so uh, we've sent our read write. We now go to State WAP begin. Um, in this case, this is where the simple design isn't really going to work. Um, we're going to have a complication here because we're going to have to actually read off of SDA. But we've made SDA an output line, so we can't really read from it. We'll come back and fix this later on. So for now, I'm just going to put a placeholder here um, so that once we're in state WAC, we're going to go to state data. And here again in data, now what I want to do is make our count do the exact same thing, basically. I want to register for data. In this case, it will be 8 bits. We're going to send the command AA. And in this case, we're going to do I squared C SDA equal to data of count, and if count is equal to zero, state is equal to state black, else count is equal to count minus one. We have the same exact problem we had here before. I need to set count before I go into data, and so count is going to be equal to seven. Um, but now we have another problem. If I were to actually run this machine, what's going to happen is we're going to transfer from state WAC to state data, and when we're done, we have to wait for another acknowledgement. And if we just reused this state, the very next state here is going to be to go back to this state, and so essentially we're going to have an infinite loop. So to fix it, we'll actually need a second wait act state. Now, it doesn't matter that they're in numerical order or not. Um, so again, we have the same problem we had before. I'm not going to drive the data line. We'll have to kind of remember that we have to fix the waiting for the acknowledgement. Um, but once we've reached the acknowledgement state, oops, there's no break. Um, we're going to want to go from that to the stop state. And when we're done, we're going to want to go to um, the idle state. Um, in stop, we're going to want to uh, 
um, drive SDA pi. Um, and then we'll deal with the clock uh, later on. Okay, but what basically at this point what we have is we have a very simple uh, state machine. Um, I want to make this my um, top level module. And I want to pay attention here because it's showing us that we do have some errors. Um, it looks like this end is for the always. And this is for the else, not reset. And this then would be, should be the end case. Um, and then this is the end state stop. Keeping these begins and ends straight can be one of the more difficult tasks, actually. Okay, so at this point now we can go to simulation and in our simulator we can go ahead and make a new test bench and Verilog test fixture, we're going to call it test step one. And essentially here we're just going to drive the clock and we're going to look to see that we have what looks like a valid signal. So to set up the clock, we'll initialize it, we'll use our forever I squared C clock is equal to one delay, not I squared C clock. And we'll get an error if I drive the same register from two different modules. And so we're going to delete that there. And we're going to essentially Oh, I'm simulating with the wrong module. Shoot. We're going to do a new test fixture. Call it step one. We'll make sure we pick the right module. Okay. And so anytime we're doing a test bench that has a clock, we need to actually set up the clock signal. So we give it an initial value, and then we are forever begin. The clock is equal to pound one dot clock. We get an error if we try to drive clock from more than one place. We want reset to be initially high. We're going to wait a period of time and then we'll bring reset equal to zero. We'll wait some number of clock cycles so we can see what the output in the wave is going to look like and then we'll be finished. So this test bench here isn't really going to actually check the signal. It's just going to let us run the simulator and see what the waveform looks like. And it should look like the waveform for our I squared C. Okay, so we got to our finish. Now we can look at the waveform. Remember here that this timing diagram is zoomed way in. So we're going to click on, I always call it the life preserver, but it's the zoom to full view. And here we can see our clock. We see the reset is high. And here is the start. Here's our sending our address, and here's our sending our data. Here's our start, our address, and so on and so on. So it actually looks like it's uh, possibly the right waveform. The one problem we do have is if we were to look at the clock time here, um, we're looking at a single clock of two nanoseconds. Two nanosecond clock is actually 500 megahertz. And so this simulator is running this design at 500 megahertz. The upper limit for I squared C is 400 kilohertz. 
Uh, the recommended is 100 kilohertz, and so we are way, 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 way too fast. So in a later lecture, we'll have to talk about getting the simulator time to match real time. Um, but for this first step, um, I think we're off to a good start. So this is using a very simple method to implement a very primitive version of an I squared C master. Um, the file is called step one. I'll post the file up to the website and as long as for this lecture. Thank you.